the aim of our charge is love. It's just from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And he says this, he says, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, desiring to be all about the rules. Are there rules for how Christians should live? Yeah, there are. But you can break those rules and still be a Christian. That's the great thing about grace. Now, we're challenging one another here. Grace exists to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. And so we are going to challenge one another to live according to God's standards. But understand, our focus here is a focus of love. That's why we're here at Grace. There was an individual who suggests that we're known for four things. Four things. I loved it. I wrote it down, but then I forgot to write down the guy's name who said it. So don't think that I'm smart enough to come up with this on my own because I didn't, okay? But there's four things we're known for. We're known for what we flee from. We are known for what we follow after, what we fight for, and what we're faithful to. Every person in this world is known for these things. You're known for what you're scared of, right? How many of us here are known for being scared of snakes? Every Christian, raise your hand, okay? All right, that's me. My wife will tell you, I hate snakes. We were raking up leaves there in Omaha one time, and she was using a rake, and she pulled them together, and I grabbed the handful, and I put it in the bag, and the snake come out at me, right? I screamed like a little girl. I, I did. Um, it was not the most manly moment in my life. Let's put it that way, okay? The snake died. I was able to go on. After we moved from that house, she told me she once found a snake in the basement, in the laundry room. She said, I didn't tell you that when we were living there, because then you wouldn't sleep down in the basement with me. She's probably right. Aye, all right? We're known for what we flee from, what we're scared of. We're known for what we follow after, what's important to us, what we fight for. What is it that makes you mad? You know buttons. People know your buttons to push, okay? And what are you faithful to? What are you dedicated to? You know, who's your favorite football team? Your favorite baseball team? We're known for trivial things like this. We should be known for this from a spiritual aspect. What we flee from, follow after, fight for, and are faithful to. Let's think about this. We should flee. What is it that we should flee? Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6. At the end of this, Paul addresses. He says, all right, church, here's what you should be known for. Well, here's what you should flee. Here's what you should follow, pursue, be faithful to. As for you, O man of God, flee these things. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. What things is that he's talking about? Well, he's looking back at what we just talked about a couple weeks ago. Flee these things. What's that? We should flee false teachings. We should run away from false teachings. What does that look like? What do false teachings look like? Well, he says it this way. He says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, does not agree with the sound doctrine, the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the teaching that accords with godliness, what is it? He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. We should flee people that are like this. Flee false teachings. John says it this way. John says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is a deceiver in the Antichrist. They would say that Jesus Christ, he was not God. He was not God become man. Maybe he was a man, but he wasn't God, or maybe he was God, but he wasn't man. They, they deny the fact that Jesus Christ was deity. They deny the fact that Jesus Christ was the God who could take away our sins. They deny that. We should avoid them like the plague. We should flee these things. We should flee the pursuit of money. Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says this, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. And we see this all the time, don't we? And it's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many, with many pangs. Jesus says it this way, no one can serve two masters. For what? For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Paul says, flee false teachings, flee the love of money. Why would he say that? Because he knows churches, people struggle with these two things. We struggle with it. We, we hear teaching that, man, it just sounds good. We want it to be good, and so sometimes we kind of get sucked into that. All of us, to a degree, struggle with this desire to have a little bit more than we have right now. If we're honest with ourselves, who wouldn't want a little bit more than we have right now, right? 
My, uh, my little girl, I was asking my little girl, she was, there was a gun auction over in Aurora yesterday. And I asked Eden, I said, Eden, you want to go to that gun auction because Grandpa Dave will take you. And she's like, why? I already have one gun. And I said, Eden, you just answered a question. Who wants just one gun? Right? There's, is that even possible? The formula for guns, you've got to solve for, for Z here. You have X equals 1 equals what you have. Y equals plus 1 equals Z, the number of guns you need, right? So the number of guns you have plus 1 is the number of guns you need, okay? We understand this. We're Christians, okay? But we understand, Paul understands that we all have a desire for more. Whether it's another gun, whether it's another T-bone steak, whether it's more bacon, all right, whatever it is, we all desire more. We do, and Paul warns us to flee the desire for more, to flee these false teachings. So what do we follow after? Paul tells us what to follow after. Very clearly, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. This is what we as a church should be known for in our community. We should be a church known to pursue these things. We should be a people known to pursue these things. We should pursue righteousness, virtue, living a, a life of goodness is really what it is. Living a life of virtue. We as people should be known as this. And if we have a church full of people who are constantly pursuing righteousness, then we're going to have a healthy church. Are we going to be perfect? Probably never. But it doesn't mean we should give up. We should be a church pursuing righteousness, pursuing godliness, this idea of being separate, holiness, right? Just because the culture's doing it doesn't mean we have to do it. Just because our friends are doing it doesn't mean we need to. We should be a church where they're like, you know what? That's a church where they live out what they believe and they don't get sucked into stuff sometimes like others do. We should be that church. We should be a church that's pursuing, chasing Faith, this, this knowledge and our beliefs, we should be pursuing this at all times. We should be pursuing love, a care for others, constantly. And there are some people, let's face it, that's easier to love than others, right? There are people in our community that's easier to love than others. Grace Church should be full of people where we never look at somebody in our community and say, wow, I think our community would be better off without them. We should never say those words, ever. We should be a church of love, caring for others, and not just people in our own family, people outside of our family as well. And God will give you opportunities to love. Are you pursuing the idea of love? We should be a church that's steadfast, dedicated to one another, dedicated to the gospel, dedicated to the truth of God's word. We should be a church full of dedication. We should be a church that's gentle, tender with one another. Some days that's hard, isn't it? You think, well, if I'm gentle to somebody, if I'm tender, are they gonna take away my man card? All right, some days we think about that. We wonder, is that possible? Well, God's word says we should be gentle. We should be tender to one another. There are days in our angers, our frustrations, our hurts, whatever it is, when things don't go our way, that we wanna be less than this. We wanna be less than this within the walls. That doesn't even include people outside the walls. With your coworkers, the people you meet on the street, other drivers, how gentle, how tender are we sometimes? We should follow that. It's tough, isn't it? We should fight for what? What is it we should fight for? Paul says these words. He says this, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight. What do you know, for you, you know for what you fight for? What's important to you? We should fight for our faith. Faith alone and Christ alone. This is it. We should never fear the loss of our salvation. We can understand that it comes from Christ, which is part two of this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to heaven, and that's what we at Grace should fight for. We are what? Christ-centered, Bible-based. That's Grace Church. It's in our bulletins. It's in our newsletters. Christ-centered, Bible-based, and that's what we should fight for as a church. Understanding Jesus is the only way. And because of that, we now have the truth of eternal life. Eternal life is something that never ends. Eternal life is guaranteed to me by the Holy Spirit that I receive through faith. Christ guarantees my eternal life. We should fight for that. Just understanding these things are, are come, they're coming from God, promised by God. He says this in Ephesians, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were what? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, and this is the best part, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We should fight for these things. Understanding the Holy Spirit comes in us and he guarantees that eternal life. I don't have to worry about losing my eternal position in God's kingdom. 
because he is giving it to me by his works, not by mine. It's by my faith. For by grace am I saved through faith. Okay? That's it. I don't have to do anything. He does it. We should fight for these things as a church. Understanding the eternal hope that we have because of what Christ does for us. We should be faithful to what? What is it we're faithful to? We're faithful to this. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. All right? What's a good confession? To keep the commandment unstained and free from, repro- free from reproach till the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying here? What's he saying to do in this? Well, look at this. We should be faithful to God's commands. We should be a church where they can look at us and say, you know what, those guys are trying to live a Christian life. Those guys are consistent. We had somebody over for supper last night in our home and, and I was just talking to this couple and I said, you know what, it's hard, but we try to live a consistent life. We try to be the same at church as we are in the community Monday through Saturday. That's what we as a church should be known for, a church consistent. Whether we like it or not, God's word is standard. And sometimes it calls us to do things that we don't necessarily want to do, but we should be faithful to God's commands. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are we faithful to this command? This is God's greatest commandments. Are we faithful to this command? We should be. We should be faithful to this command. We should be faithful to Christ our Savior. Christ our Savior is who we should be faithful to. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14a. Keep the commandment unstained, free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is a blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, check this out, who alone has immortality. I love this part. Who alone has immortality. Who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be what? To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is my king. This is my Christ. And we as a church should be faithful to this Christ who gave everything for us. He alone has immortality. He alone can offer us eternal life. This is our God. And sometimes I think we forget to be in awe of who God is. We forget the significance of who this God is. We as a church, to be a healthy church, we will never forget who God is and what he's done for us. We'll never forget that he is the one who gets the honor. He is the one who gets the glory. It's not for us, it's for him. Yes, we celebrate what Christ is doing here at Grace, but he's doing it not because of us, but he's doing it in spite of us, right? We're broken people. All of us are. But Christ is the one who gets the glory. Next Sunday, we've got an amazing baptismal service planned right now. Last I checked, we've got six people who want to be baptized next Sunday. Is that because of any great thing that God is, that, that I am doing as a pastor? I, would don't, I don't think so. It's because God is working in these people's hearts, helping them become mature followers of Jesus Christ. And all of us are, in, are part of this. All of us are. And that's an amazing thing. We should be faithful to Christ, our Savior, remembering who he is and what he did for us. And then Paul, closing the book, gives a reminder It's a hard reminder, but he closes the book out with this. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty in order to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future that they may take hold of that which is truly life. He gives us a little reminder at the very end. What's he saying? He's saying this, don't trust wealth, instead trust God. For those of us who've been tracking the markets at all this week, you recognize that the markets had the worst week in the history as far as the number of points has dropped, all right? Who cares? Isn't God the one in charge of this? How many of us have gone this week without a meal because the markets plummeted? Not this white boy, all right? I'll tell you that right now. I'm still eating great, okay? And by, based on the fact I couldn't get in a suit this morning, I can tell I'm still eating fine. I had breakfast with somebody this last week, and they were, I don't even know how I got off on this subject, but he made comment how our stomach acid is strong enough to eat steel. And I thought about that for just a second, and as I told him, that explains where my abs have went. Now I know. <laughs> We can understand this, right? God is saying, look, don't trust your possessions. Don't trust, well, those things can disappear in a heartbeat. I will always be there. Instead, trust God. He says, do good. He says, well, yeah, but he writes this for the rich. If we did a little bit of a study and compared this congregation to the average person in the world today, 
I would imagine we'd be at least in the top 5% as far as wealth in the whole world. We would be considered rich. This is true for all of us in this congregation today. Don't trust wealth, instead trust God. Do good. Be generous, not stingy. Some of us have the idea, well, I give to the church. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna challenge you this way. You're saying, Pastor, don't push buttons, buddy. You're getting close. Well, the Bible talks about money more than it talks about faith and prayer combined, okay? So if I ignore money, then I'm ignoring a lot of what the scripture talks about because, again, it talks about money more than, the, more than faith and more than prayer combined. It talks about money. If Jesus were sitting with you when you had your taxes done and he was reviewing your contributions, would he categorize you as generous? Whoa, stepping on toes, aren't we? God tells us that a healthy church is a church whose members are generous. Not stingy, generous. Not giving just a little bit, we're talking generous. How would Christ describe you? How would he describe you? Look for the greater reward. He says this. Thus storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of that which is truly life. There is a reward coming and it may not be here on this earth but there is a greater reward coming if we do these things. If we can trust God instead of wealth, if we can do good, if we can be generous, there is a reward coming for us. God says, look for that greater reward. And then he tells Timothy, he tells Timothy these words, he says this, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by it, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Then he says these four words, grace be with you. Timothy, guard the deposit. Avoid irreverent babble. Grace be with you. What do we learn from this? We need to guard the teachings of the Bible. We need to stand strong, guard the deposit entrusted to you, guard the teachings of the Bible. Again, Paul says it over and over and over again. Avoid false teachings. Avoid them. Guard what is true. And don't engage in foolish cultural discussions. I was getting my hair cut last month and I had a lady asking me about a certain religion, paganism. But you know what, I walked away from that and I was talking to Rachel about it. I got sucked in because by the end of the conversation, I could tell she didn't want to hear the truth. She just wanted ammunition. That's what she wanted. And I got sucked into something. The truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter what you believe, there's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus. That's it. Nothing else needs to be said. That's it. Don't engage with this stuff. Guard the gospel. That's what we're here to guard. And the reality is, Paul says to Timothy, grace be with you. I read that and I thought, you know what? We are always going to need grace, aren't we? Always going to need God's grace. Doesn't matter who we are, how great our life is, we are going to need God's grace every single day of our lives. We're going to need it. So what? What does this mean for us? Well, understand this. Being a healthy church takes effort. It takes effort, it takes sacrifice. It is not easy to do good. It is not easy to trust in God rather than wealth when we see the markets falling apart and we think, what's this gonna do to my job, to my income? How's this gonna affect my retirement? All these different things. It's hard. It's hard to be generous in those times. It is hard. It takes effort. It is hard sometimes to stand up for what we believe when the culture around us is saying something completely different. And there are a lot of distractions out there, a ton of distractions out there. It's easy to get sidelined. God's grace is the difference. God's grace is the difference. God's grace can make a difference in our lives as we live according to the standards of God's word. God's grace helps us. And here's the thing, we should be known as Grace Church, a church growing in grace. In this community in St. Paul, if we're gonna reach 240 people in just three more short years, less than three years now, we need to be known as that church It's not just called grace, but the church that is grace. Peter writes this, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Our challenge from God is we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. We are always going to need grace. Paul has entrusted us and entrusted Timothy there with this message. And he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, guard it. 
It has come from God. Guard it, guard it, guard it. We at Grace have been given that same message. Again, we're Christ-centered, Bible-based, here to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. We can never forget that this is our foundation. And none of us may ever know it perfectly, but we should always be pursuing, pursuing, pursuing the truth of God's word. These words that we have that are so very important to us. The worship team's gonna come up here while I'm praying. We're gonna close our service on the hymn, Ancient Words. Ancient Words, and how true that is. These words that have never changed, but can sure change us if we let them. God, I thank you for the truth of your Bible. I thank you for First Timothy. I thank you for this challenge for us as a church as we're reminded finally what it means to be a healthy church. And it's hard, it's a challenge for us. God, you've called us to live this way. Lord, help us as we grow. Help us to do this in a way that's honoring to you. Seeking your honor, not our own. And may we always be faithful to your commands. Living in a way that's, man, that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.